I'd, I'd like to um, acknowledge first the uh, First Nations of the world, uh, especially uh, the country that I'm from um, and the, the southern part of America, um, the Native Americans, the Seminole Indians that were never taken off their land at Miami because I was born at Miami Beach. And my name's Elaine Sarum, and I'd also like to acknowledge the elders past and present of the land Australia that we're on, the elders all over this country because of the photographs behind us. And I'd like to introduce to you Carol Johnson, um, four and a half decades of, of dance that um, Carol here has um, produced in Australia and um, was the director of and, and founded, um, now called NASDA, used to be AIDT, and um, and uh, also the most well-known of all of them is Bangara. I care all over to you. <laughs> good, to, good to be here and good to talk to you. Just that acknowledgement is just so important and I think it's one of the best things that Indigenous Australians have done and I've watched it grow over the past 16, over the past 16 years, it's about 16 years when it became uh, when it started. I think it started either in 1999 or 1998, but it has grown so that uh, just about every important uh, event, someone, either an elder, uh, welcomes people to the country, or the person who's giving the uh, event uh, gives an acknowledgement to the elders past and present. And I realized in looking, looking at America how I'd like to see something like that happen. And in last year, when I took the uh, Nays the Dancers, after I took the Nays the Dancers to the uh, to the uh, to to America, I participated in a uh, Welcome to Country uh, program. A uh, uh, Maori uh, choreographer was working with an uh, uh, institute at NYU headed by a Chinese American, the Asia Pacific American uh, Institute. And he was working in dance, and he had a uh, exchange. But the ending of the program, it was all about a welcome to country, and Americans didn't know it. And I, I, I lived in New York for years, and never knew until last year, 2016, the Lenape Lenape people are the uh, were the original owners of New York, mm -hmm. and and they called and Manhattan, Manhattan was the was was their was part of their home. Oh. And that these people I, know that either. I know, I know, <laughs> nobody does probably in New York. That's amazing. And just, and I'm doing research now on it and I was reading about uh, Jersey, Bergen County, where I come from, the Rampapo people that are called mountain people, uh, it, part of they're part of a Lenape, Lenape uh, nation because that is a big it's a big nation. Uh, are the uh, uh, are the indigenous uh, owners of the First Nations people. And New Jersey has acknowledged them, but uh, 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 New York hasn't acknowledged those particular people yet or the nation. So uh, I, my driving force now is, and my desire is to have America understand and come to acknowledge both the uh, First Nation people, because they, they're the custodians and the cares of the land, and they've been caring for the land and still care for it. I mean, what's happening in uh, Dakota with the Sioux is, you know, is true, horrendous. True. And, and then the uh, African Americans, uh, the des descendants of the slave, they have helped build this country. And the thing that I think uh, that I see is that America has demonized the First Nation people, the Native Americans, in order to take over the country, and they've uh, dehumanized uh, the uh, black African slaves as well. And they haven't done that with any other group because other peoples, all the immigrant groups, are invited and you, uh, into the nation to be white, which is why you have this white uh, English. nation. Yeah, but they, yeah. no, it, it's. 
if you didn't have, you have, you need the black, you have the black and the Native Americans, they're the other, and everybody else is uh -huh. part of something. Now, they helped build the country, too, but they weren't dehumanized. Wow. And they weren't needed in order to build the country. So that's, uh, that, that acknowledgement, I think, has to be done, I won't say how, but I think if we have to find a way to do it in such a way that the least educated white person and the poorest can hear it and understand it in a so ongoing way. So everybody, everybody can hear it. Calling, uh, the, t changing the name from Indian to Native American is a step. You know, because if you say Native American, people know that it, it is the original settlers. So at least that we have that, or they have made that happen. And I think we need to go even further as a country. It's a, it's a wonderful and, idea. And I think Australia, I hope Australia can help in that, or we yes. from NASDA and the dance can help help make people more aware. And so the idea then would be, at a football game, for instance, they would, would they, someone might. I don't want. Yeah. Oh, might acknowledge at the beginning of the football game. That acknowledge would be great the local people. Like that would I'm just trying to think of an example so that, yeah. because it, it it sounds a little bit airy fairy for me because Americans well, never did it when I was there. Yeah. But um, so if if everybody did it. It would it would just happen automatically. It should happen automatically. Because in in Australia, where I have been here for forty five years, and and you have to, well, I came in seventy one. You came in seventy two. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just normal that if we have a board meeting or I go to a little meeting in a little room, people, there is a respect, and the person that leads it stands up and says. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past and present. And then they name the local people that this land is on, the, and it would be Eora if we were here, or Gattyville people if we were, um, because this is Sydney. So I think that if, um, where I came from in my hometown, I don't even know the name, which is a little bit embarrassing, because no, no, no people live there and I don't want to go into that at all. However, the name of our football team in my high school I graduated from was called the Seminole Indians. Oh. And so that's why, I've, and because I was born in Miami Beach, all the rest of my family was born right in that hometown, even my father and my grandfather. But the reason why I was born in Miami Beach was my father was in the Second World War, and he was out in the water in a Navy ship. My mother was waiting on the shore at Miami Beach. <laughs> but that is the Seminole Indian country, because the Everglades yeah. is right there. And they never got the Seminoles out of the out of the Everglades, yeah, well, because they, uh, the, the soldiers tried, they went know. in after them, and the snakes and the alligators were there. No, I don't <laughs> so, think, I think they're still... Officially and they still have that land. Or, or they were when I was a kid. Yeah, I they still have that, that land. They were still supposedly... On their own land. land. Yeah. And my father always said, when we went around that area, we're going to stop, and you have to spend your uh, pocket money, you buy a souvenir from these people, because they are the first owners of the land, and they still have little stalls by the side mm -hmm. of the road, and I remember I had this little little cup, and it said Seminole Indians on it, and I didn't bring it to America with me. My parents probably still have it in the attic somewhere or something, and I don't know what happened to it, because my parents had passed away, so. Yeah, well, that's, well at least he, he did acknowledge them, and yeah, people do acknowledge it to yes. a little bit. And and there were Indian wars, uh, and and it was glorified. Or you know, hero Indians and hero Alamo or like Custer's Last Stand. Mm -hmm. However, when I came here, I was a history teacher, and they told me what to teach. That it, that the the Aboriginal wars were erased. They don't have heroes except now. All of a sudden, people talk about them away, and it's just coming out that. Oh, there were some people that fought back. Yeah. Oh, there were massacres, and there were, you know, things happening that, and, and there, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but I'm frustrated that 
how could they have erased generations of history? But that's what in Australia history his story. Whoever's telling the story tells the story the way they want, and so you that's what you do in terms of building building a nation. And Australia built yeah. it uh, on top of the Aboriginal people who were declared not to be here. No, they either came up They were declared this wasn't a land of, uh, they just came in and there was nobody here. So if there's nobody here, uh, they can take it over, yeah. which makes this welcome to country even more dynamic and even more that important they were because, here. You're, because you're all of a sudden saying that's not true when we're, we're yes. these people are welcome. So it's a really very subtle but very strong uh, statement and I think young people hearing it over and over and over again uh, will, it's very important. and. Going back to America, when uh, Angela Flournoy came last year in uh, 2016, she wrote an article that appeared in the New York Times really? in, about her experiencing this. She's an African-American novelist and she came with her mother and she said she heard it every place and she wrote a beautiful article that was in the, and she's a you know well-known, well-established, prize-winning win novelist. Young, young, and it was in the new the January first uh, Sunday Times literary section, and two weeks later, I just happened to hear it last week. I hadn't told you this. Angela Davis really? was giving a speech at the at a um, at its justice uh, ba banquet. I'm, I don't remember the name of the organization. In I think it was, they were, she was in Memphis, Tennessee, though. And the first thing she did was a gave acknowledgement to the <gasps> indigenous oh. people. The first minute and a half. And I've listened to a lot of talks of, of her over the period of time, and I've never heard her give in the first first minute and a half an acknowledgement of the elders past and present on whose land we How How is the letting? I, I, I mean, you two must weeks have later, just like I, just, crying. I, I, I was, you know, I was, uh, I was because I had thought, you know, in 2014 I had thought of something like that should be done and, and then I put it away because everybody said, oh, it couldn't happen, nobody would do it. And then <laughs> That's very exciting to Angela, me. and so I'm thinking, Angela, Angela, two angels. Angela Flournoy writes an article in the New York Times. I don't think it's coincidence that Angela Davis sees it because the New York Times is such oh, a big, you know. That is so exciting. Sunday, Sunday Times. Yeah, so <laughs> it's in the air. Yeah, it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, it is. It really is. And I think that nobody. Can, uh, it's going to change the next generation. It will in America yeah, if we can. If we can. If, it, if it can. And I think uh, we can get the conversation going. I think more and more. And I, yes. That's what is my mission now. And I think being both Americans that we are, we can um, work towards that or strive and and try so hard to publicize it and we can do it through dance, we can do it through photographs, we can do it through the history and from another country. Because sometimes people listen to, oh, the Australians do it, they've got a good country, they don't have, they don't go to war as much or have internal, we don't even have as much shootings because of our gun control, for instance. And I don't want to go out down the <laughs> road right now, but I think we have a wonderful country, Australia. And one of one reason why is that the, the, the original people, the Aboriginal people, the Torres Strait Islander people are acknowledged in the correct way, with respect, and, and it's going to continue. Yeah, it really so. won it's very important. It's very strong. Yeah. Yeah. And we did it through dance uh, last year. We the dance Good. that the Good. That's students wonderful. that I brought to congratulations to, to IABD. We, the dance was about welcome to country, and it's a foreign. It is a foreign concept to Americans, but I think that's what we dancers, and people from Australia, can give. 
Okay, that's wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm, I'm so proud of that. That's, that's I wonderful. think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. Okay, that's really great. And um, have you got a little a film of that? I have, the, I, have the video, yeah. I have the video of it. I need to learn how to take it off. Edit of my, it. Like, no, I need to get it digitized. Okay. I need to get it digitized. Well, we can get help with that, maybe. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in my computer okay. or on a disc. They, they gave me okay. a disc. Just a little clip of it to, to show what we're talking well, about. Have people would be really nice, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, I guess what I really wanted to do at the beginning of this talk is to um, acknowledge um, where we were coming from in the civil rights movement because I did um, feel very strongly and wanted to work within the civil rights movement for integration and I was at university at the time because I graduated in 1963 and it was in full swing and I remember even going to um, is something called the John Birch Society <laughs> meetings to try to because the Ku Klux Klan wasn't openly holding meetings I would go to but I wanted to find out about why um, a lot of the, the uh, Afro-American leaders uh, were called communists or why was Martin Luther so demonized in the South like why did my father for instance, hate him. <laughs> and I really, uh, when I went to university, I marched against Vietnam and the v Vietnam War, which I thought was totally wrong. The French couldn't win it. How could America even go into their jungles? And, 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 and the problem was, with me was that my older brother, Kent, who I love very much, was in Vietnam. So when I marched in that parade, I got spit on. Mm -hmm. I got jeered at and kicked. And even my ex-husband told me that if I got arrested, he'd let me rot in jail. And he said, and I'm sure your father will let you rot there too for protesting against America's war. So with that in mind, I, I, in a, I came here when I was 25 years old as a teacher. And they told me I had to teach history and I had never studied history. <laughs> so that's where I came here, uh, not as a photographer, but... Um, soon found that Aboriginal people did not, were not, I don't know how to explain it, they just didn't have a place in society very much. Mm -hmm. And so you at the same time in 1972 came and then we didn't meet until Andy Reese, Andrea Reese introduced us later, um, but you came the year after me and I think that um, that's where we, where we talked about the last time that we met. Mm -hmm. in, in the dance in my hallway in Michelle Blackney's home and oh, yeah. I think that it, you could pick up where you left off um, or you could um, if you want to say anything about the integration time or the Vietnam War what I was just um, pick up on I don't know I just uh, wanted to place it where we came from somehow the history yeah, well, at the was, times yeah well there was I remember and I guess I, I am politically interested and involved. I wouldn't have said that before, but I remember uh, McCarthy era, and I don't know if I was listening. I know I was listening to it because I was very uh, interested in what was going on, but I don't know if it was radio or television that I was listening to some of the hearings and what was going on, and, and my parents would be uh, would talking about uh, you know how horrible it was, and how hor how horrible what what uh, McCarthy had done to all the uh, so many of the artists, uh, particularly the people in the movies, uh, couldn't work and were blacklisted, and and America made this whole big thing up about communism. You know that we had to fight this. That it was just so horrible, and I. What I what was happening to the people I think was horrible and it had to be more horrible than the uh, than communists. So I was I was listening to all that and my father uh, used to listen to the radio and Edward R. Murrow was the uh, newscaster. Every night we had to hear uh, the news news because we had it was turned on at dinner. The, 
dinner time and then turned off after because we didn't have anything but we had to he had to look, listen to Edward Armour so I guess I was hearing what was going on and hearing his discussions as well well about uh, freedom yeah so so you you grew up with all of that in the background. Yeah, and then of course Martin Luther King came along and I started reading you know, a little bit about him because I was still I was still home by that at that time and uh, the civil rights and I'm just wondering why in the world it seemed ridiculous to me that they have to make a law in order to uh, so that we could be eat in restaurants. Integrated. And, yeah, eat in restaurants or go to uh, Go, go into bathrooms. I mean, America seems to have a horrible... I don't know why you make laws about people going to the toilet, which is what they're doing now in terms of the, the sexual thing. I mean, what difference does it make? Uh, you don't make laws. Laws are about helping people, not... Well, it, yeah, unisex. It, it, it's, but over there, it's, it is different in America. It, 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 well, yeah, but why... I mean, you had black toilets and white toilets. I mean, just true. In the, and 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 in the south, uh, it was called colored toilets and white toilets, or whatever. Me. Yeah, or whatever. You had colored or black or white, and, and white fountain and black fountain. Yeah, and, like and, a drinking fountain. And today they have that they have the, in the south again these laws of transsexuals, transgender toilets. They want want. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Why does America have preoccupation with toilets? <laughs> they do have a preoccupation. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> but anyway, that has nothing to do with dance. <laughs> it is. I can see what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the dance. So, so I guess I, I wanted to know. I always wanted to do something special in dance, and I, but I thought I was going to be a great dancer. Yeah. And I did become a very good dancer. You I was are a leader. You still are, <laughs> leader. Kelly. You still are. But I didn't become great in the a great performer dancer yes. in the sense of uh, you know the Alvin Ailey, Judy Jameson, yes. uh, or Bernetikoff, Dimensional Man, or Marco Fontaine, or Maria Tolchi. I didn't get get into that status, which and I actually wanted to be a ballet dancer, but that wasn't for me at that time because uh, there were very few black people yes. who were dancing. There were some in, in my generation and they were a company and they went out or like Raven Wilkinson who I've since met and she's a little bit older than me. She was in uh, Ballet Russe but then had to leave because uh, they found out she was black. And you know, I had I went to school with Betsy Ann Dickerson. She danced in the Rockettes and she uh, I mean, with the ballet corps, and she, we grew up, but she was fair. That's a very fair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was, she was very, very fair. But what she told me.